Three decades ago, Frontline told the story of a Pennsylvania community divided over abortion. And this is a life-size model of a pregnant uterus. Now we return to examine a conflict that has only escalated. We realize if we're ever going to outlaw abortion, that we have to be able to help women who feel that's their only alternative. And to hear from women caught in the middle. Because I'm a mother, I'm not supposed to be doing stuff like this, right? It's not that simple, though. As the battle continues, there was the sense that women simply can't make moral decisions on their own. The state has to intervene and, and tell them what to do. It's a 24 hour waiting An intimate look at abortion, the people on both sides. This is literally a life or death decision, and to ask a, a mother to think about it for 24 hours is very reasonable. And the struggle over complex choices. Some patients are like, I don't want to be doing this, but it is the right choice for me. Only they know what they should do. The abortion divide. Thirty-six years ago, I spent weeks in Chester, Pennsylvania, making a film about abortion for Frontline's first season. It was ten years after Roe v. Wade. Tonight, on Frontline, for the first time on American television, the experience of abortion. With this vacuum cleaner type tube, the baby is literally pulled apart and ripped to pieces. This is the story of the anguish of four women, two who decide to have their babies, and two who choose to come here. The abortion clinic. The film revolved around the Reproductive Health and Counseling Center. Women who came to the abortion clinic spoke about their decisions. Can you tell me why you chose this option as opposed to the other ones? Do you know what they are? No. You don't know what your no. other options are? Well, keeping it adoption. Mm -hmm. But I know if I went through the nine months, I would have kept it. Mm -hmm. And then it wouldn't have had the life, a good life, because I can't support myself yet. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be able to handle being a single parent on my own. Our Father, who art in heaven. Those in the community who steadfastly opposed abortion and the clinic's existence marched outside. Girls are coming here on Saturday morning to have abortions. We pray for their babies and for them, and we also pray for the, for the abortionists. Maybe some of them don't realize what they're doing. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Last year, I returned to Pennsylvania, once again to a community that is today even more bitterly divided over abortion than it was 36 years ago. The conflict may be decades old, but one thing has not changed. Women facing unplanned pregnancies still confront the same urgent and sometimes wrenching decision. The original clinic from the first film merged with another clinic that now operates out of this unremarkable building in Philadelphia. There are no signs for the clinic but there are always protesters on the streets outside. Excuse me, ma'am. Do you know how many babies are killed here, ma'am? Just two. You'd like to make an appointment? The Philadelphia Women's Center began providing abortions in 1973. As many as 6,000 pregnancies a year are terminated here. And do you have any children? Six. Six. One, two, two three, four, four, nine, ten. Nine, ten. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rebecca Mercier has been an abortion provider for 11 years. Every kind of woman gets abortions. Um, women who are young, women who are old, women of all races, women of all religions, women who uh, it's their first pregnancy, women with lots of children, um, women who never thought that they would be seeking an abortion. We see all of them here. The clinic operates five days a week. 
On some of the days we were there, there were as many as 60 patients. Dr. Lisa Pereira has been an abortion provider since 2003. The patients are so thankful and appreciative that they can come somewhere and be treated with dignity and respect because they're making a choice that is theirs to make. Do you have any children? Yes, four. Four, okay. Any stillborns? No. Any miscarriages? No. Have you ever had an abortion before? Mm-hmm, one. Okay. Well, this is my choice that I'm doing because I don't want to bring another child into the world and I'm not financially stable. I'm already struggling with the four that I have. So I'm not sure what my other option would be, but if this wasn't the option, then I know I would be struggling. Most of the women we approached to be in the film declined. Those who chose to speak, like Shahara and Taryn, told us they wanted their stories to be heard. I'd had unprotected sex just one time with someone that I'd been seeing, and I thought, well, you know, surely one time, you know, I would just get sort of a grace period on that. I had essentially talked myself out of the fact that I was pregnant. Have you ever had a vaginal ultrasound? I don't think so. OK, a little bit of gel, a little bit of pressure. So camera on the tip, it gives me a nice clean look inside the uterus. I already have two small children. Uh, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old uh, from a previous marriage. And I'm recently single. Uh, I have a corporate career. And so I decided that the best thing for me to do at this point in my life was going to be to terminate the pregnancy. So your ultrasound results, I saw a multiple pregnancy. So I saw twins. Wow. OK, I measured one at 5.4, so five weeks and four days, and twin B at 5.6. OK? OK. All right. So I'm going to do your blood pressure. Now, does this change anything in your decision today? No. And it doesn't change anything on our end as well, OK? okay. So everything stays just the same. This is not a position that I ever thought I would be in. My initial thought was, I should tell no one about this, right? Like, this should just be, you know, a secret that I, that I, take, to my, that I take to my grave because it'll change how people, you know, see me fundamentally or, or people will judge me for this. OK. And you can set your face down anywhere you like. I'm going to have you lay back right where you are and just open it to you. Okay. So the gel's going to feel a little cold on your stomach, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm seeing something that uh, resembles um, another sack. Twins. Oh, my God. So I'm going to do some... Um, what does that mean? So, like, like, is, is the procedure any different? No, it's exactly the same. There's no different. Why does it feel so different? Why does it feel different? Yeah, yeah. When she said that they were twins, I, I wasn't prepared for that at all. I didn't even consider the possibility. I don't know. It's not a rational thing. It felt... It made things a little different. It's a hard no, decision. It completely does. You got your your six weeks right now, which means mm -hmm. you have plenty of time. Do you feel like if you guys went home and thought about it for like even like a few days and made sure that this is what you want to do, like that would give you a little more time to think about it? Like I want you to be certain that this is what you want to do. It was a, it was a double punch. Oh yeah, for sure. It was a. Um, we're not taking this lightly at all. I want you to be guys to be confident and you can always reschedule and come back on Tuesday if you want. I appreciate that and, and I, I 
force, like, our son couldn't do it. He is on the spectrum. Non-specific autism, more leaning towards Asperger's. He doesn't like to interact with humans. He doesn't like children at all. I think that this has a lot to do with Noble. A lot to do with my son. We've been married for five years. We have two children that were very planned. Um, I've, one is four and starting preschool, the other is two, just turned two. And um, we found ourselves unexpectedly pregnant. Um, you know, motherhood is a huge part of my identity and uh, it wasn't an easy decision to come here today, but it definitely was necessary. We just bought a house. We are recovering financially from that, and this was just not the time, not a good time. I grew up Catholic, and, um, you know, they, they kind of teach you very young, and I went to Catholic school too, like, you know, this abortion's wrong, you shouldn't do it, um, it's a sin, all that, all that stuff. No one's going down to the corner store picking up a, 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 an abortion like they're picking up a, a pack of cigarettes. It's not, it's not that easy. I have the lovely dress for me. I'm just not so cold. A little pressure. Okay, six weeks and one day, okay. You know, I wanted to look at the screen, but I didn't want to look, and I don't know, I feel like being a, a parent already has made it kind of an even more difficult thing, and even more reason, you know, for some that I shouldn't have had this today or shouldn't talk about it. Um, Why do you think that is? Because I'm a mother. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be doing stuff like this, right? Um, you know, what's one more, right? <laughs> it's not that simple, though. Um, you know. I'm a medical doctor. This is what your baby looks like. I think you ought to at least take a look at it while you're sitting there in the waiting room. Dr. George Izayu is the Pennsylvania director of the Catholic Medical Association. I first met Dr. Izayu on the sidewalk outside the clinic where we shot the first frontline film 36 years ago. And this is a life-size, real-size model of a pregnant uterus 10 weeks from conception. And as a matter of fact, you and I were once this size and even smaller. So that's the first victim in abortion. And My conviction is that life begins at conception and every baby, by the time you even recognize that there's a pregnancy, is already an individual, unique human being that uh, and then here's the, where the religion comes in, who is not only uh, unique, but the soul will survive the death. And the reason I'm explaining this to you is because... In my Dr. Rezaio's activism has always been rooted in the counseling of young women to reject abortion. When we first met, he was counseling as many as six women a week. This is the result of an abortion at about 11 weeks with this vacuum cleaner type tube the baby is literally pulled apart and ripped to pieces and been killed by that process. I don't see how anybody can do that. I know that when women find out what abortion really does and what it's all about, there are very few who really want to do that to their baby. Okay, here we have uh, 14 weeks. And now the main difference is the baby is bigger and the skin is becoming thicker, so now the baby is no longer as transparent. And that's what he looks like now inside right? me? That's what he looks like, or she. 
What were your feelings when you found out that you were pregnant? Oh, I could have hit the ceiling, really. I just wanted to forget about it, and I was still doing away. So you obviously were not planning this pregnancy? No, it was not planned at all. <laughs> Sir, are you, are you the father of the baby, sir? If you're the father of the baby, you have a stake in this. I need you to stand over there. Without right. harassing anyone, without bothering Wait a minute. anyone. Harassing is in the eyes of the beholder. I'm not prepared this, to go to jail. I've been this? in jail over this, but okay. but, but I don't back, think you, you, you go back to jail. I don't think this would stand would up in court. Like to go back yeah. to jail. Do you would think you like, do you, you think like this would stand theory? up in court? Would you like to test it? If there was different circumstances, Sir, I would. I need you to stand over right. here. In 1986, Dr. Isaiah was arrested and convicted of a felony okay. for trespassing inside the clinic where the first film was shot. At this particular time, I don't have the uh, the time to get arrested and spend that time in court. Our father. <laughs> Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. The first thing you encounter when entering the clinic is the bulletproof glass separating the public areas from the clinic itself. Recent years have seen an increase in intimidation of patients and threats against doctors, like Dr. Pereira, who was singled out online on a website run by the group Operation Rescue. I'm not afraid of being threatened by them, but it is framed in reality. There are people that are violent toward abortion providers. Yesterday was the anniversary of the murder of Dr. George Tiller, who was one of the idols in our community, and he was shot in his church while he was an usher on a Sunday morning. So many of us think about that. Sure, we think about that. That can happen. The presence of protesters outside the clinic is a persistent reminder of the threat. They're outside most days that I'm here. They walk up and down the sidewalk. They hold their signs. They yell things at the patients. I've never seen them become violent. But everyone who works in this community should be and is aware of the threat of violence. In 1982, when the first film was shot, security was light. The waiting room was relaxed and felt like a doctor's office. The staff wore street clothes. Then, the procedure rooms were spare, with a minimum of equipment. The clinic today has the look of a hospital. Anti-abortion groups in Pennsylvania and 23 other states have pressed for the passage of laws that mandate abortion clinics operate as ambulatory surgical facilities. Pennsylvania implemented regulations under the Ambulatory Surgical Facilities Act that governs everything from the width of hallways to where sinks are located to the HVAC systems to the job descriptions. Abortion care providers have come into compliance with numerous regulations at great cost, at great financial cost to the women who need abortions. And also it's limited the number of abortion providers in this state. We had to spend over $500,000 on improvements um, that did nothing to improve the health of our patients. Anti-abortion activists see this as progress. Our most recent bill on abortion facilities uh, restricted supply. It said if you want to operate an abortion facility, you have to meet certain requirements, the same as any other ambulatory surgical facility. And several of them did not. We went from 22 freestanding abortion facilities down to 14. Hello, my name is Dr. Mercier. Pennsylvania requires that we give you the following information before we see you for an abortion procedure. Like many other states, Pennsylvania now requires that doctors read a script to inform women of alternatives to abortion and the potential risks of the procedure. Infection, heavy bleeding or clots in the uterus needing removal, problems with future pregnancies, infertility, damage to the cervix, vagina, or uterus, or to other abdominal organs requiring hospitalization or additional surgery. For abortion, these risks are very low. Pennsylvania was the first state to mandate the message be delivered 24 hours before a woman's abortion. This is literally a life or death decision. And we should be doing whatever we can to, to save mothers and children from abortion, to make women think about it. And we make no apologies for that. 
There is the sense that women simply can't make moral decisions on their own. The state has to intervene and, and tell them what to do. I think it's pure hypocrisy. Okay. Now, as far as getting you scheduled, okay, with that information okay. session, there is a 24-hour waiting period. We're going to review your medical history, and we can get that appointment all set up. remember the first day of your last normal The clinic's period? call center is open seven days a week. And when we visited, there was a constant flow of incoming calls to schedule abortions. Are you looking to do the medical abortion by pill or the surgical procedure? A medical abortion procedure is very similar to inducing a miscarriage. Um, it is safe for women to do up to about 10 weeks of their pregnancy. So do you have any questions before we get you started here? No. Nope. A great procedure for women who want to feel like they have control over the procedure, who wants to just have everything happen in the privacy of their own home. The drug Mefepristone RU486 was approved by the FDA in 2000. Medical abortions now account for roughly a third of all abortions in Pennsylvania. This is the first pill you're going to take. This is the one called the Mifepristone. This is the stuff that makes the pregnancy stop growing and start to unattach a little bit from the uterus. It gets the process started. Okay. So you swallow that down like a regular pill. Okay. 24 hours later, she takes another pill called mesoprostol that helps to induce the cramping and the bleeding that will actually help her body push the pregnancy tissue out of her uterus. This is the mesoprostol medicine. Gives you a little bit of the miscarriage symptoms. Okay. Okay. And then you have your follow-up appointment made? I do. Okay. In a week or two? Yes. Okay. That's really important because we want to see... What I hope I feel is a sense of peace, not only with myself and in the decision that I've made, but also a sense of peace with these two beings that I've chosen not to bring into the world. Thank you for choosing me, and I'm honored to be given this gift of life. And also, I, I can't do it right now. I can't accept that mantle in terms of the other lives that I'm taking care of and I'm responsible for. I think I'm always going to feel a little bit of guilt but we have to feel comfortable with the decision we made. I know I'll definitely be sad um, because if things had just been a little bit different, you know, maybe this wouldn't have happened today, but, you know, I'm confident in the decision we made. This is the medication abortion pill, the mefepristone. I'm gonna have you swallow this with a small sip of water or as much of a sip of water as you want. So that's the one that starts the abortion process. Dr. Monique Ribeiro is an obstetrician gynecologist who frequently protests on the streets outside the Women's Center. The destruction of any life is a definite affront to God. So when an abortion takes place and an innocent life that has not done any harm to anybody is destroyed, I believe that that is one of the greatest sadnesses of God, but it pleases the devil. I'm an OBGYN physician, sir. She deserves to have options. I know she feels boxed in. I know you guys feel like you have to do this. We can help her. It used to be that people tried to be present on the killing days, the days when the surgical abortions were known to happen in the abortion centers. But RU486 pill has completely changed the landscape of abortion, and it really necessitates that somebody is present outside of these abortion centers every single day, every hour that they are open. Sweetie, if you took the abortion pill, we can reverse it. You have 72 hours, honey. They don't want me to talk to you, but this is information that can help you. You deserve to know all of the options, okay? Dr. Ribeiro is part of a network of doctors who cite anecdotal evidence to support the controversial practice of prescribing the hormone progesterone to reverse the effects of RU486. I think there's only maybe three of us in this Philadelphia area that have volunteered for that hotline so far. So they call the hotline and then you get the, the woman's history and you don't even have to see her. You call into their pharmacy and you get them these high doses of progesterone, which are easily available. The babies that are saved from the RU486 do awesome, and they don't have any problems following, as far as we know.
We can help you. If you took the abortion pill, we can reverse it. And we've been so blessed. In my office alone, we've had three reversals. It's so nice to see at the end of the road, those moms are so grateful and um, so happy that they chose to reverse. And would you like to know how far you are today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm dating at nine weeks and one day. Okay. I'm grateful that I'm getting this taken care of. If I wasn't, I would be at home, you know, trying to stressed out, trying to figure out what my next move is or what my next plan is. So it is a, it's, it's a relief. Because I was stressed out before I walked in this door this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Lover, nice to meet you. Thank you. Any questions, concerns about anything today? About three minutes start to finish, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the last part of the consent form the nurse already reviewed with you. I just need your signature and date here on the top line. Shahara chose to have a surgical abortion under IV sedation. You might feel a little warm feeling going through your IV side, okay? It's normal and it'll go away. IV sedation was not an option for patients at the clinic where the first film was shot. Patients then were awake, and the procedure was uncomfortable, even painful. You're drifting off to sleep, okay? Take some nice big deep breaths. Most patients opt to have a surgical procedure. Like Shahara, they want to leave the clinic with the abortion behind them. Surgical abortion is incredibly safe. The woman is in stirrups. We uh, do a bimanual exam to feel the positioning of the uterus. I place the speculum, clean off the cervix, and then place a small clip on the top of the cervix to straighten out the uterine canal. The second part of the procedure is dilating the cervix, which is um, using instruments to gently open the entry into the uterus, and then removing the pregnancy tissue using suction. It takes somewhere between two and five minutes. Complications are incredibly rare. One of the most important components of safety with abortion procedures is making sure all of the pregnancy tissue has been removed from the uterus. The tissue is taken to a special room within the clinic. It is rinsed off and it's looked at in a special dish with a little backlight on it that lets us confirm that we are seeing all the tissue that would be expected for the gestational age of the pregnancy, and that lets us know that there weren't any complications. The gestational age of this fetus was nine weeks and one day. Up to nine to 10 weeks, it's just a small little piece of translucent sac tissue with nothing that looks recognizable as any kind of fetal parts. After that, you do see um, small bits of tissue that are recognizable as fetal tissue. Forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven. Bless us, O Lord, hear our cry for justice. Bless us, O Lord, our God. Give us this day our daily bread. Dr. Izayu introduced me to Pat Stanton. Pat comes from a family of pro-life activists. In the 1980s, his late father organized the protests that take place every Saturday outside the Philadelphia Women's Center. Moms, we can help you. Change your mind. We're out here. It's barbaric to chop a baby up, put it in a little canister, take it out and count the pieces. That's what they have to do. Who's doing this? What kind of world have we entered into where we do this to our children? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Predominantly, the protesters are older white males, and the patients are young women. Lynn Moulter coordinates the volunteers who escort women into the clinic. I don't understand why older white men think it's appropriate for them to be um, standing at a clinic where young women come for health care, be talking to them, interacting with them, sometimes touching them. 
Please don't do this. The baby's heart is already beating. What sometimes happens is the woman will get there and freeze. Real help. And realize what it is that they're walking into. The magnitude and the yelling can be very upsetting to them. Verse. I think it's a spiritual battle myself. It's between us and Satan. Uh, and I think when we uh, do our best to follow our Lord and the Ten Commandments, we will conquer and, and bring others to our side in a loving manner. This is life, that's death. We're here to help you. Stanton often tries to speak to the men who accompany women to the clinic. Pray for strength and pray for wisdom. If there's any chance that this girl can come out of there, Lord, let it happen. Let it be a miracle. Let this baby grow up to be a great man. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. My girl just said the only way she's walking out of there is if she says that they're twins. And I'm like, what's the difference between what's one that? or two? That doesn't make any logical sense. But, I mean, what the hell? Like, I just can't. I don't want to make it seem like I'm controlling her. Like, Christian, sometimes all they need is a word from you. They got to feel that the man's behind them 100%. How many kids you got? Nine. Nah. I'd go in there and give her one more shot and bring a couple other women out, brother. Christian did go back into the clinic but he told us later that his girlfriend went ahead with the abortion. So we know that we just have to stay the course and we're gonna be beaten up and, and, and have many, uh, many failures, but we have to continue. So I would say perseverance has been a, a virtue that's instilled by our faith. You can't be a part-time Christian and fight a full-time devil. The clearest symbol of today's anti-abortion movement is the Crisis Pregnancy Center there were only a few operating in the early 1980s. Now there are thousands across the country. They're very well-connected and they're very well-funded. Their whole existence is to persuade women who go there not to have abortions. And um, it, it, it ranges from gentle persuasion to fairly coercive persuasion. There are as many as 150 in Pennsylvania, many located near abortion clinics. But unlike abortion clinics, they are not required to be licensed by the state. The Crisis Pregnancy Center is a beautiful phase of the pro-life movement that offers real help and hope to women in crisis pregnancies. Um, we realize if we're ever going to outlaw abortion, that we have to be able to help women who, who feel that's their only alternative. And we've provided an answer, no, that's not your only alternative. And it has literally saved thousands of lives every year in the Philadelphia area. Amnion is a crisis pregnancy center that caters to low-income women. The mission of Amnion is really to serve um, anybody in an unplanned pregnancy. If someone is calling to schedule an abortion, I will tell them that we don't perform abortions here because I want to be truthful with them right up front. Um, but I always say to them, but you've called the right place, because I want them to know that right away, that we do have services for them. Amnion's approach is to offer counseling, parenting classes, clothing, diapers, and pregnancy testing all for free. Thank you. You can have a seat. So have you already tested at home to see if you were pregnant? Yeah, I did last um, Friday. OK, what did you get? It was a negative but my period is late, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. We offer pregnancy testing, but we don't provide contraception here. We don't want people engaging in behavior that's risky to them emotionally um, and physically. We want to encourage them to make better choices with their behavior. We realize that promiscuity drives abortion, so therefore part of our, our great cause is promoting the chastity message. Contraception takes away a natural barrier to promiscuity, and promiscuity is what drives abortion. So this paper is just saying you were here today for a pregnancy test and it was negative, okay? Mm -hmm. So either that means you're not pregnant mm -hmm. or you are pregnant, but it's too early to tell. Now you would still be pretty early, so if you haven't gotten your period, when you come back, we'll retest you. Mm -hmm. Andriana, come on back. Andriana is 22 with an eight-month-old daughter. Your test is coming up positive. Congratulations. Tell me how you're feeling about your pregnancy. So fine. Yeah. Were you trying to get pregnant? No. OK. So it wasn't planned, but it's no, OK. It wasn't planned. 
Your mom, what does she have to say about it? Is she happy she for you? She was not happy. Was not happy, okay. We use ultrasound as a tool uh, for helping our clients uh, choose life. So you're gonna be able to look up here and see everything we're doing, okay? We set up a big screen up on the wall so that they can look up and see what's going on inside their uterus and how the baby's growing. Do we want to see the baby inside your uterus? And then we want to measure and see how far along you are, okay? Now, did I do your ultrasound with her? Yeah. She's talking to us. She says, that's my brother or sister. Okay, we have eight weeks one day, plus or minus six here. Andriana, this is your baby right here, okay? This flickering here is the heart beating. You see that? That beating heart, it's hard to then, you know, deny that there's, um, there's a baby. It's not, it's not just tissue there. It's not something that's easily um, disposed of. I'm gonna measure the body length again. The women who are happy that they're pregnant or on the fence, a lot of times they're just really surprised. You can see it in their face that there's a, a joyful reaction. Some women who are maybe considering abortion are, are kind of um, not thrilled. You know, they might be looking and it might bring up a lot of complex feelings for them. I have offered to pray with women and I will do that if I feel like they're open to that. Um, and most of the time they've said yes. <laughs> I have only had a couple people who have said no. And here's your picture. Okay, you're welcome. That's really where we have an opportunity to form a relationship with a client, to show them that we care about them on all those different levels. We care about you as a person, as a spiritual person, and as a person with an eternal soul, and we want to be able to really show you that you're loved here. The staff at Amnion counsels against abortion based on their Christian faith. We met one woman who was unpersuaded and came to the Philadelphia Women's Center. Skye is 23 years old, and this is her first pregnancy. And I just need to confirm that you're here for abortion services today, obviously. Mm -hmm. You're confident in your decision to terminate your pregnancy. Mm -hmm. No one is forcing you to terminate your pregnancy nope. today. I went to Amnion Pregnancy Center. Um, it's in Upper Darby. Just read normal. The services that they provide are free. The nurse did though say to me, like, are you sure you don't want to just, you know, put it up for adoption? You know what I mean? Like, she was kind of like pro-life. <laughs> Listen, you know, you can come back with your boyfriend. We can talk about different options. We can do another ultrasound again, and then he can look at the baby as well, maybe change his mind with that. I'm just like, no, <laughs> no let me just get this over with. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the depression or sadness later. There you go. Thank you. Welcome, and you can go ahead and swallow that. I'm going to be upset about it for a little bit. I'm going to pray probably every single night now. I just felt like I was a horrible person for deciding to actually go through with an abortion to kill a human being, even though it was only like an embryo. So that was, that was sad, but I gotta go back to work. Skye earns less than $300 a week. Like other women we met at the clinic, she struggles to support herself. These women no longer can, they are homeless. Most collect some form of public assistance. They are living at Mother's Home in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. It's a shelter for pregnant women that's housed in what was once a convent. Hi, how are you doing today? Okay, very good. It was founded in 1991 by a group led by Dr. Izayu. Being able to promise them a place to live was an extremely powerful tool. That gave him the courage to choose life. Mother's Home can house up to 20 women. They can stay while pregnant and for six months after they deliver. The common circumstance that brings the majority of our residents here is trauma. There's abuse. There's a lot of domestic violence. There's drug addiction. Um, there's trauma that's just overflowing from childhood. 
things that never healed, disconnected families. Our goal is to support those women who, in spite of their circumstances, still want to give birth to these babies. When women come in for the interview, they've already made the decision that they want to keep their baby. They are just looking for a safe place. Where are you living? Um, some guy let me stay at his house. He said I had until today. Today is your deadline? Yes. All right. So do you have any interactions with the father of your child? No. OK. I just want to get my kids home. You want to get your kids home? My oldest daughter has cerebral palsy. My youngest stays with my aunt in Connecticut. OK. They're able to come home. I just don't have a home. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Once you have the baby, a lot of people forget about you. She can't raise that baby if she's not healthy mentally and physically. So there's no sense in ending it there. Like, yes, everyone can say they're pro-life, but you have to, to put that into like motion. You have to help the woman after she has the baby. Often the criticism that is leveled is that we're only interested in the, in the baby in the womb and uh, only helping the woman until the baby left the womb, the baby was uh, delivered, and after that, uh, uh, we, we weren't interested in helping women. But that is not the case. Before he started Mother's Home, Dr. Izayu and his wife invited young pregnant women to live in their own home. This is the scene in 1982. We found in the counseling that women would saying, I don't really want an abortion, but if I don't have an abortion, my husband will, will leave me or he'll kick me out or my parents will kick me out. I went in to see Dr. Sayu Tuesday um, and I talked to him for like, I told him all about it, like, you know, that everything that was happening. And like, then he told me about how my, if I, if I were have, if I were to have an abortion, how the abortion would be performed, it, I, like a salt injection would be injected into my stomach and like the baby would slowly die inside of me, like the skin be burning away. So I said, I'm just gonna go ahead with the pregnancy and I, I'll come live with you so I can get the proper care and all. Nancy decided to put her baby up for adoption. Because I'm, we're not, we feel, I feel anyway that we're not ready to have kids yet because we're not financially sound. I don't want to be, when I have my kids, I want to be financially sound. Then we're going to start planning on having children the proper way. We don't want to bring unwanted children into the world and have them abused like other children are. We want to grow, we want to raise our children up right. Not like our parents. We both come from broken homes and I don't want my kids raised and had, I don't want to feel that I'm going to have my kids brought up, and me and Nancy are going to split up. I don't want to feel that way. Because me and Larry, we're not going to split up. We're going to be together forever. I'm so glad I didn't get an abortion. I am. OK, ready for grace again? Mm -hmm. Bless us, O oh Lord, for these our gifts which we are about to receive from thy family, through Christ our Lord. Amen. 38 women over a period of 15 years, high school students and college students. Now, over time, we were getting a different kind of woman. You know, often we were getting, uh, somebody was addicted. Sometimes we were getting uh, people who had HIV and uh, other problems. It was a little more tension in terms of trying to house them in private homes. And then the, the whole movement throughout the country to create maternity homes was very important. There are now 17 similar homes in the Philadelphia area. Many were founded by people like Dr. Azayu, who opposed premarital sex. When I was a teenager, if you had sex with a girl, if she got pregnant, it, you're, you're the father. You're responsible for not only the baby, but her for the rest of your life, or you're going to have to marry her. I would think if we still had all the nuns and we still had the teaching the way it was, we'd have fewer girls needing housing because they wouldn't be getting pregnant. It's not a view shared by the residents we met. What many do share with Dr. Izayu is his view on abortion. They reject it. And for some, it is a choice they've now made over and over again. I was just kind of going crazy, like, no, I don't want to be pregnant no more. <laughs> no more babies. But I don't believe in abortion, so 
I come from a big family. I think babies are a blessing. That's why I have all eight of mine. And I guess that's just how my family is. Don't none of my family believe in it, like abortions. Two of Rosie's children live with her sister. Five are in foster care. I need a big house. I have a lot of kids. <laughs> Society has allowed women to say it's okay to be a single mother to multiple children. So it's very hard to blame her for it when she doesn't know any better. Maybe her mother was that way. Uh, the whole neighborhood was that way. This is what's happened in our society. His name is Dominic J. Sear. He was premature, like a high-risk thing. I have previously had a drug problem. Doing way better than I have. I did good before, but I've, I've, done, I've done worse. A shoulder might not be the best thing in everybody's mind, but that helped us a lot, so. I have four, four babies. You have two girls and two boys. They live in Western Pennsylvania. My aunt has them, so. So they're good, but they do call her mommy. So I was offended at first, but then I understood like they needed a mommy and I was not proving capable of doing that at the time, so. Now we're trying again. He's pretty special and nobody taking this one. <laughs> They may not have been able to get it right the first time, or the second time, or the third, or the fourth, but this is another chance. Me and her dad, Trinity's dad, we partied a lot together, and we were both sent to prison um, when I was like eight months pregnant with her when I got out. I was homeless. I was literally homeless. I lived down in my car for like a week. There we go. She has a rare um, condition called septo-optic dysplasia. It affects the hormones in her body, and then her optic nerves are also affected. It's an abnormality in her brain. I didn't know for four months I was pregnant. I was still on birth control, and I was drinking, like I was smoking, like living like the fast life. And lo and behold, there was a little heartbeat. And that's when they told me how far I was. Um, I was gonna go and abort her, but I was literally in the chair about to get it done and like I had to leave. I got up and I walked out and I said, I cannot kill my baby. <laughs> so I just accepted that whatever was meant to be would be. So just one day at a time and I'm prepared f for whatever can happen with her. The stigma that society says about single mothers who are poor, they are drained on the finances of the community. They've made mistakes. These children are mistakes. Why do we have to take care of them? They should give their children to other people. They've been even advised to have an abortion because there's nothing that they can give to a child but every single woman that comes through that door, that's their desire to give their child a better chance at life. Mother's Home lacks the resources to follow residents after they leave. The obvious question of what happens to the women and their children goes unanswered. Christine and Micah made what was for them a very difficult decision. Okay, I love you. Thank you. They chose to go ahead with the abortion. How are you doing today? Very nice. Some patients are like, I don't want to be doing this, but it is the right choice for me. And it's okay to feel those emotions, it's okay. I try to just let them know it is okay. Doesn't mean they shouldn't do it, only they know what they should do. Nice, slow, deep breath, little oxygen. Only they know what they should do. It's a statement I heard 36 years ago and continue to hear repeated today. 
I respect people that say abortion is wrong, but people have abortions, people have babies, life is complicated. Women are not vessels for just carrying pregnancies. They are full human beings who deserve to have um, control of their lives. And being able to choose whether you're going to continue a pregnancy or not is a life-changing thing. But the anti-abortion forces I met here in Pennsylvania are unmoved by any argument for abortion. They are more organized, more dedicated, and even more uncompromising than they were 36 years ago. They are committed to one goal, ending abortion no matter how long it takes. It's gonna be brutal and bloody, and we're only in the second or third round of this fight. This fight is going to be multi-generational, just as the fight against slavery was, and it'll be our successors that eventually win this fight. I'm not predicting a quick and easy victory, but we, we will at some point win. The end of the battle over abortion here in Pennsylvania and everywhere else seems a long way off. and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org frontline. To order Frontline's The Abortion Divide on DVD, visit Shop PBS or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. This program is also available on Amazon Prime Video.